very exciting to be here. I appreciate that introduction. I like introductions that set low expectations. So that was <laughs> very good. So um, I, I'm guessing, uh, you know, based on, on who's in the room, that, that y'all might be fairly familiar with Khan Academy. But I always like to start uh, presentations like this just to get a sense of, of the audience. Um, how many of y'all, actually, how many of y'all are teachers? I'm curious. OK. And how many of you are, I, I guess the other option is administrators? OK. And how many of you are neither teachers nor administrators? OK. I don't know exactly what you're doing, but I'll <laughs> assume it's important. Um, and then how many of you are, are somewhat familiar with Khan Academy before the introduction? OK. How, actually, maybe a better question is, how many of you all are not familiar with Khan Academy before the introduction? Oh, there's a couple of, no, OK. How many of y'all, how many of y'all use Khan Academy? Curious. OK. And how many of y'all have not used Khan Academy? OK, good. That's, I'm here to talk to y'all. Uh, so as, as was introduced, Khan Academy is most associated, or oftentimes associated, with this collection of videos that I started making for my cousins back in 2006. Uh, but as we'll, we'll talk about, it's, it's much, much more than just those videos now. But to get everyone on the same page of what those videos look like, I'll start with this montage. All of these interactions are just through the gravity. This is an age right after Isaac Newton. I'm told the humidity makes it feel hotter. Why is this? Excellent question, LeBron. And you can just see the pleasure he had. Can you determine which light bulb is being switched? Things actually can interbreed, although for these two in particular, it seems like the mechanics would get kind of difficult. And I can keep playing around with these numbers and see what kind of colors I can come up with. If this does not blow your mind, then you have no emotion. Glad y'all appreciate Euler's identity as much as I do. So uh, as I mentioned, it's, we're much, much more than just videos. Uh, a big push that we've been doing, and we hopefully we'll talk more about it, we'll do a Q&A at the end of this, is uh, really emphasizing the project-based experiential learning. Uh, and, and this is our computer science platform that really emphasizes that, where kids can code, they can see in a very visual way, they can interact with their programs, they can save it in their portfolios, they can share it with their friends, they can splinter off. And we just added peer-to-peer -peer assessment on these portfolios uh, so that they can really experience uh, not just you know, solving math problems, but actually applying that, that, that mathematical knowledge to doing really creative things. This is, I, would, I guess I would call this the meat of Khan Academy, which is our, our missions experience. And we have missions everywhere from early learning all the way through college level calculus, completely standards aligned, exhaustive coverage of all of the, all of the skills, uh, and we'll, and Common Core and, and in the AP. And it's, it's centered around making sure students can fill in their gaps, move at their own pace, master, su master subjects, and have a whole series of game mechanics to keep them motivated and engaged. And we'll, we'll talk more about that. So uh, this is actually just a little bit of an update, some of the numbers that, that we actually just heard in the introduction. Uh, about half a million educators have registered on Khan Academy, using Khan Academy to some degree. And actually, we suspect many, many more uh, who have not registered, who are just using it unlogged in. Uh, 12 million uh, monthly unique users. Actually, I think the number was 13 million last month. Uh, and 2.5 and billion uh, exercises done. Uh, but before going more into where Khan Academy is now and, and, and where it's going, I'll rewind a little bit and give you a little bit more texture on, on how all of this started. And uh, you know, y'all learned a little bit from the introduction, and, and it sounds like a lot of y'all are reasonably familiar with it. Uh, but it, it, I think to, to fully appreciate these numbers and to appreciate how surreal it is for me, uh, a little texture might, might help. Uh, you rewind back to 2004. Uh, my background was in engineering computer science, but I had just kind of done a career transition out of business school. I was working as an analyst at a, at a small hedge fund in, in Boston. And, uh, it just came out of conversation one day from my cousins visiting from New Orleans that they were having, that my oldest cousin, Nadia, was having trouble, the oldest one visiting, she was 12 years old, was having trouble in math. So I offered to tutor her when she went back. She goes back to New Orleans. We get on the phone every day. Uh, we, 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 we figure out a way on the internet to see each other's writing. And I help tutor her. And, and the whole catalyst for this was she took a placement test at the end of sixth grade that placed her into a remedial math track. And the reason, at least her guess of the reason, was that she just completely couldn't get unit conversion, kilometers to meters, uh, you know, to miles, ounces to gallons, things like that. So I started working with her. Early on, she had no confidence in herself. Slowly but surely, she kind of progressed. After about a month, 
she actually caught up with her class, got unit conversion. Another month, she frankly, I think, got a little ahead of her class. I started teaching her some basic algebra. And at that point, I became what I call a tiger cousin. <laughs> so I, I called up her school, and I said, you know, I really think uh, Nadia Rehman should retake that placement exam from last year. They said, who are you? I said, I'm her cousin. Uh, somewhat surprising, they let her take it. Uh, and she went, she was placed, the same girl who placed in remedial math class a few months ago was now in an advanced math class. So I was kind of hooked on this, so I started working with her younger brothers, uh, working remotely. And so over the next two years, a couple of things happened. One, the firm I was working for, and I use the term very generously, it was uh, myself, my boss, and, and his dog. Uh, we, uh, his wife, my, my boss's wife, uh, became, became a professor at Stanford Law School, so we moved the firm out to Silicon Valley. Uh, the other thing that happened, that word got around the family that free tutoring was going on. And so I, I uh, found myself every day after work, working with about 10 or 15 cousins uh, all over the country. Um, and to help myself scale a little bit, uh, I started making this, this little software tools where it would give them uh, problems, as many problems as they needed. I, as their tutor, could see what they were doing, when they were doing it, how long it was taking them. Uh, as a way for them to get practice and for, to inform me in our sessions. And I was showing this off to a friend at a dinner party in 2006, and his question was like, hey Sal, this is really cool, but how are you scaling up your actual lessons, your actual tutorials? And I said, you know, it's, it's actually a lot more difficult. What I could have done with just Nadia, or just with Nadia and Arman, or Ali, I can't do with 10 or 15 cousins. And he said, and I give him full credit, his name is Zulfikar Ramzan, he said, well I got an idea, why don't you record some of your lessons as videos, upload them onto YouTube? And I immediately said, no, that's, that's a horrible idea. YouTube is for cats playing piano. It's not for serious mathematics. Uh, I got over the idea that it wasn't my idea, and that weekend I gave it a shot. And uh, you know, long story short, I started telling my cousins, why don't you take a look at it, what do you think? Uh, after a few weeks of this, uh, they gave me the somewhat strange backhanded feedback that they like me better on YouTube than in person. <laughs> and at first that was a little bit weird to parse, uh, because why would they like this kind of automated version of their cousin more than their cousin? And, but when you really think about it from their perspective, it made a lot of sense. It was on demand, it, uh, they didn't have to feel judged if they were in ninth grade and they forgot some of their fifth grade decimals, uh, they could engage with it when, when they needed it. And they weren't saying that they didn't appreciate me, they still really appreciated having a mentor there, someone to guide them, someone to help them navigate uh, there and answer their questions and to, to dig deeper and do more experiential things. So I kept going, and it soon became clear that uh, people who were not my cousins were watching. And, you know, comments started to come in, and some of those early comments, they were often just a simple thank you. And even that was a pretty big deal. Uh, I don't know how much time y'all spend on YouTube. Most of the comments are not thank you. <laughs> they are somewhat edgier. Uh, so I kept going, but then the comments got more intense. This is why I was able to pass my algebra class. This is the reason why I want to be a physics major now. I'm retiring from the military, and this is what's allowing me to go back to college. And so that, I kept getting these letters. It kept motivating me more and more and more. The viewership kept growing and growing and growing. By 2008, I felt like there's something here, so I set it up as a not-for-profit organization, even then not thinking that I was going to quit my job and, and work on it full-time. But by 2009, there was on the order of about 100,000 people who were using Khan Academy, uh, mainly the videos, but also starting to use the software in a pretty significant way um, on a regular basis, on a monthly basis. And so I sat down with my wife. We had a little bit of a, 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 a down payment for our house. Uh, but we figured, hey, look, uh, there's something here. Why don't I take the, a year to focus on this and see if I can turn this into a, into a real effort, a real organization? And I think any time you do anything entrepreneurial, whether it is for-profit or not-for-profit, you almost have to start with that somewhat delusional optimism. Uh, you know, I had already started talking to a bunch of people who are all kind of saying, hey, this is great, what you're doing is awesome, come talk to us, we might be interested. And so after I quit my job in fall of 2009, I immediately started having a lot of these conversations. And like a lot of entrepreneurial stories, you, you quickly realize kind of the reality of it. A lot of people are saying, well, this is nice, this is interesting, but it's not exactly what we would fund. You're kind of the strange hybrid between this tech thing and this not-for-profit. And after about nine months of that, I started to get pretty nervous. Uh, and I was getting five or ten dollar donations off of PayPal. For, it was amounting to a few hundred dollars a month. Uh, if it was any of y'all, thank you. Uh, 
But we were digging into our savings about $5,000 a month. My, my first son had just been born, uh, and so it was pretty stressful for me. But then all of a sudden, a $10,000 donation came in. And so I immediately see who it is. Her name was Ann Doer. She was local. I was in Mountain View. She's in Palo Alto. I immediately email her back. I said, thank you so much for this incredibly generous donation. It's the largest donation that Khan Academy has ever received. If we were a physical school, you would now have a building named after you. <laughs> and Anne immediately replied back and says, well, I use Khan Academy with my daughters. I use it myself for finance and economics. I'd love to learn more about what you're doing. So a few days later, we're at an Indian buffet restaurant in downtown Palo Alto. And Anne asks me, well, what's your goal? And I told her, well, when you fill out the paperwork with the IRS, there's a part of the form It says mission, colon, they give you about a line and a half. And I wrote, a mission to provide a free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. And Anne said, well, that's ambitious. How, how do you see yourself doing that? And I told her, I was like, you know, this, this, is, this is a mission. I don't plan to just check it off tomorrow and then move on to healthcare or something. But I think we can make a lot of progress. And I showed her, I, I used to walk around with the stack of letters that I had received from people all over the planet. I had screenshots of the software I had written. I showed her the data, the, the analytics that I had on my cousins. Uh, I, was show, I showed her the view, the view count on the videos. And Anne said, well, you know, somewhat surprisingly, you're making a lot of progress. I only have one, one question. How are you supporting yourself? And in as proud of a way as possible, I said, I'm not. <laughs> and so Anne kind of processes that. We part ways. Ten minutes later, I'm driving into my driveway. I get a text message. I, I read it. It says, it's from Anne. It says, you really need to be supporting yourself. I've just wired you $100,000. So that was a good day. <laughs> and, and frankly, it was the beginning as a cascade of, of crazier and crazier events. A month later, I was running a little summer camp with a friend, Aragon, and the whole idea was, okay, I'm doing all this virtual stuff, but the virtual stuff was never meant to somehow replace the physical. In my mind, it was always to liberate the physical. If, if, if information delivery and practice could happen at a student's own time and pace, couldn't the physical classroom be used for more simulations, for more projects, for more Socratic dialogue? And so at this camp, I was running a simulation. I had uh, six seventh graders playing a game of Risk, while the other 20 seventh graders traded securities based on the outcome of the game of Risk. Very good game. And then all of a sudden, I start getting text messages from Anne, which you can imagine I now take very seriously. So and there were like six or seven of them. It wasn't clear what order they came in. It was kind of cryptic. But they read along the lines of, I'm at the Aspen Ideas Festival in the main pavilion, thousands of people in the room, Bill Gates on stage, last five minutes talking about Khan Academy. So I didn't know what to make of this, so I immediately boot the nearest seventh grader off of a computer, <laughs> and I start looking for some evidence of this event. And after a few minutes, I found it. Literally, uh, the head of the Aspen Institute, Walter Isaacson, asked Bill Gates, what are you excited about? He randomly starts saying, there's a site called Khan Academy. I use it with my kids. I use it myself. And you can imagine how I, I was feeling. It was surreal. Uh, it, wasn't, it didn't feel like it was really happening. But actually, my very next response was, I, I became nervous. Those videos were for Nadia, not Bill Gates. <laughs> and, and then, you know, I kind of start to process it. Uh, a couple of friends heard about it. They started emailing me. That night I go home, I told my wife about it. And then I was like, well, wh well what do I do next? Do, do I call him? I'm gu guessing he's not listed. And they left me in that limbo state for about two weeks. Two weeks later, I'm in my walk-in closet. I'm about to record a video. And, <laughs> and my cell phone rings. Uh, Seattle number. I answer it. Hello? Hi, this is Larry Cohen. I'm Bill Gates' chief of staff. Uh, you might have heard that Bill's a fan. Yeah, I heard that. <laughs> if, you're, if you're free in the next few weeks, we'd love to fly you up to Seattle, learn more about what you're doing and ways that we might be able to work together. And I was looking at my calendar for the month, completely blank. <laughs> so I said, yeah, you know, I've got to cut my nails next Wednesday, but maybe I can meet Bill Gates. So we had the meeting. Uh, it was actually eerily similar to the meeting with Anne. At around the same time, folks from Google reached out. 
uh, similar questions, similar meetings with, with uh, what we had with the Gates Foundation and, and with Anne. And so all of a sudden, fall of 2010, it all came together. We got our first significant funding from the Gates Foundation and Google, and since then, many, many other great foundations and philanthropists and, and, and individual donors of all levels uh, to kind of turn to a real organization. And so what we re immediately started working on, once we were able to kind of hire up a team, and this initial team was only four people, uh, five people, was really building on the software. Because the whole pitch to Anne and Bill Gates and Gates Foundation and Google and others has always been, look, videos are just a start, but that's not, you know, our mission is an education, and that's not an education. A real education is in conjunction with real human beings, so we need to make more tools for teachers and coaches. A real education involves interactivity, so we need to give exercises and feedback. And a real education will involve community and involve outlets for project-based learning, so we should have ways eventually for kids to program and have simulations. Obviously, we've done some of that since then. But what we immediately started working on was some of that, that initial software that I started making for my cousins in 2005. And this right over here that you see, this is what we call our knowledge map. And it's no longer the primary navigational interface for Khan Academy. Uh, but I show it because it shows how we think about at least math education, or at least the core of math education. And so each circle that you see there is a concept in mathematics. At the very top of it would be basic arithmetic, basic addition. And as you get further and further down that map, and if you were even to scroll down, you would get into algebra and trigonometry and geometry and pre-calculus and calculus and even beyond that. And the idea behind this is, and you know, obviously our videos go well beyond just math, but our exercise platform is primarily math now, soon to go into the, into the sciences. But the idea behind this is, okay, once a student masters basic addition, they're now ready for basic subtraction and maybe level two addition. Once they've mastered exponents, they're now ready for negative exponents and logarithms. And to a large degree, that's common sense. That's the way a video game would work. In a video game, you keep working on level one until you beat the boss, and then you go to level two. It's the way martial arts work. You keep practicing your white belt skills until you master it. You take the white belt test, and then only if you pass the white belt test do you move on to yellow belt skills. It's the way you would learn a musical instrument. But what we point out is it's not the way that a traditional academic model is architectured. In a traditional academic model, and this is really an artifact of the the 18th and 19th century Prussians, the Industrial Revolution 200 years ago, is we batch students together, usually by age, sometimes based on age and perceived ability, and we, we move them together at a set pace. And what typically happens is they go to class, they'll get a, a little bit of a lecture, some new information, they go home, they do homework, they come the next day, review homework, lecture, homework, review homework, lecture. That continues for two or three weeks, and then they get an exam. And let's say that that exam, the unit that we were covering, was introduction to exponents, basic exponents. And let's say on that exam, I get a 70%, you get an 80%, you get a 90%, you get a 95%. And then after the exam identified those gaps, you know, I didn't know 30% of the material. Even the A student didn't know 5% of the material. It then moves the whole class onto the next subject, probably a subject that's going to build on that. Logarithms, negative exponents, fractional exponents, whatever it might be and probably building on those very same gaps that we just identified. And to think about on some levels how absurd that is, imagine if we did other things in our life that way, like home building. So you, build a, you, you, you take the contractor in and you tell them, well, I, you know, I've been told we have three weeks to build this foundation. Do what you can. So he, he does what he can. Maybe the supplies don't show up. Maybe it rains. Maybe the, some of the workers fall sick. Three weeks later, the inspector comes and says, OK, concrete's still wet right over there. That part's not quite up to code. I'd give it an 80%. Say, oh, great, that's a C. Let's build the first floor. Same thing. You say, we have two weeks. Do what you can. They build it 70%. OK, second floor, third floor, fourth floor. And all of a sudden, when you're building the fourth floor, the whole thing collapses. And if the reaction is the way a lot of people have in education, they say, oh, well, maybe we needed a better contractor. Or maybe we needed more inspection, or more rigorous inspection. But what's obvious what was happening here, it, had, it, it could have not had nothing to do with the contractor. It might have been the best contractor on the planet. You might have had the best inspection on the planet. But you were taking the trouble of inspecting, and you were identifying weaknesses, but then you ignore them. You were artificially constraining how long you had to build a foundation, pretty much ensuring these gaps that are going to undermine the building over time. And so what we say is, instead of holding fixed and artificially constraining when and how long someone has to learn something, pretty much ensuring a variable outcome, A, B, C, D, F, do it the other way around. Use tools to allow every student to learn at their own pace, 
and, 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 have, and, 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 have, and the variable can be when and how long they actually learn the concept. And then what can become fixed, like in martial arts or in musical instruments or in construction is, what's fixed is that every student masters at the A level, at the 100% level, masters basic exponents, and then can move on to logarithms or negative exponents or whatever else. So this is, it sounds like a lot of y'all are uh, uh, users of Khan Academy. Uh, this is one of our dashboards that's actually uh, been updated since, but some of y'all might remember this. Uh, but for those of you who haven't used Khan Academy, this is, th this is one of the dashboards that can give you a sense of how it can be used in a classroom. So each row there is a student in the class. Each column is one of those concepts that you saw on the knowledge map. And you know, if, you, if you go back to the early videos where I showed the missions and you saw those exercises, that's, the, th that's what the students would be actually working on. But this is a, a view of what students are mastering different skills or having trouble. Deep blue means the student has mastered the skill. Red means that they're having trouble. And so a teacher can look at this and say, okay, look, there's a, uh, there's a couple of students who have mastered solid geometry, uh, but there's four students who are having trouble with it. Maybe I could let every student work at their own pace, and I could do a focused intervention with those four students having difficulty. Or even better, maybe I can get those students who have already mastered it to tutor their peers. Or even better, maybe I can create a, maybe I can create a culture in the classroom where that, that, where that happens organically, where people seek and give help to each other and learn to, to teach each other. So this is some data from a, a school in Oakland, California, Oakland Unity School. And before I talk about the data, I want to give it a huge grain of salt um, in, in that you know, what I'm about to talk about, Khan Academy is a tool, and any tool, whether it's Khan Academy, whether it's a computer, whether it's a chalkboard, it's only going to be as effective as, as how it's used. And so when we talk about great use cases of Khan Academy, like I'm about to do, uh, it's, in my mind, 99% the teacher. And the teacher here, his name is Peter McIntosh. Uh, you know, before Khan Academy existed, he's, al he's, he's always been a believer that his job isn't information just dissemination, but his job is to change the mindsets of students, to make them active learners, for them to take agency. And he also viewed, he saw this issue. This is a, a ninth grade algebra class. Uh, it's a charter school. The students are coming out of the, out of, a lot of them are, are coming uh, two, three years behind grade level, entering into the ninth grade. And he saw these Swiss cheese gaps, these, these gaps in their foundations that we just talked about. So he was always looking for a way to, one, free him up, so that he can focus more on one-on-one -on -one interactions, more coaching, more changing students' mindsets, but also allowing his students who are at all different skill levels to remediate their gaps and then move ahead at the, at the, at, at, at the appropriate pace. And so as soon as Khan Academy existed, and these were in the early days, this was kind of right when we got that initial funding, he became a, a very early adopter of it. And this was a math classroom, a ninth grade algebra classroom that in 2000, actually the data before the slide, in 2010, it was in the 22nd percentile in the state of California. And over the next four years, this, the most recent data is that they were actually in the 99.7th percentile. There was actually only eight ninth grade algebra classes that were performing better than them. And once again, you know, it, as exciting as it is, and this is something that Peter McIntosh opened our minds to, he's like, look, the test scores improved and that's great and that seems to be what everyone cares about, but what I care about is what I saw happen in the students that more than their test scores improved, these students started to take agency. These were students who disengaged very quickly, who thought they were bad at math. Now they were pulling information. They no longer saw the teacher as an antagonist. They saw the teacher as someone on their side. They saw the teacher as a mentor or coach. And these are the types of this kind of metacognitive, this ability to kind of take control of your learning. These are the, th this is a skill that is arguably much more powerful than even factoring a polynomial or learning about exponents. Now everything I've talked about so far, this is in, in schools, but 90% of our, of our now almost you know, 12, 13 million users every month are outside of schools, just random people trying to tap into their potential. And this next video is, is probably one of the best examples we've seen of that uh, recently. So I actually uh, dropped out of high school twice, um, both during my freshman year. Um, and when I eventually came back, I was put in sort of lower level math and science classes because I was so behind. Um, then I discovered Khan Academy. Um, and I was able to skip two years worth of math just through using the site. And I came into school, I took the exam with students who had been enrolled in the class all year, and I was actually able to get the highest or the second highest scores in the class. Um, so for me, Khan Academy really changed the trajectory of my entire life. 
um, because without it, I don't think I ever really would have been inspired to, to learn and to love math and to love science. Um, I ended up graduating as a valedictorian and going on to Princeton, where I'm now a computer science major, and I'm absolutely passionate about learning, about computers, about math, about science. Um, and without Khan Academy, I don't think that these things would really matter to me the way that they do today. So I'd just like to say a massive thank you to everyone at Khan Academy, Saul and the team. Um, please keep doing the good work that you're doing because you're really changing lives. So, well. so what was exciting about that, we, we, when we found out he's a computer science major, we actually contacted him and he said, you know, we have internships. And he applied and he did amazingly well in, 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 in the internships. And so he actually had joined us this last summer and he was, you know, one of the strongest uh, interns that we've ever had and we actually have a, a full-time offer out to him now. So in our own strange way, we're, we're solving our own labor problems. <laughs> yeah. But in all fairness, you know, and this goes back to Peter McIntosh, you know, Khan Academy is a tool, it's only as good as how it's used. Likewise, even for Charlie here, it's a tool and clearly Charlie had something in him uh, you know, often called a growth mindset, this belief that he is capable of changing his ability if he, if he persists at something, if he really engages with something, versus a fixed mindset where you only believe that, you know, you're either born smart or you're not. And the question is, is if we can, if we can get more students the, a mindset like Charlie's or like Peter McIntosh's students, what could we do? And so uh, last year, Comcast came to us. They were interested in supporting us with some uh, uh, public service announcements. And so this was the first time we said, well, what would we do if we got free ad space on TV? And so it kind of entered our brain of like, well, what if we did a, a growth mindset intervention on, on the country, or at least attempted to start a growth mindset intervention on the country? Uh, and you know, growth mindset interventions is based on the work of Carol Dweck at Stanford, Angela Duckworth at University of Pennsylvania, and others. This idea that we can change people from a fixed to growth mindset if they learn that their ability is not fixed in stone, that through struggle and failure is actually how you learn and grow. And so what we did is we designed a, a, a little video, a, an ad really, uh, that's designed explicitly to help build people's growth mindset. So I'll show that right now. Nobody's born smart. We all start at zero. Can't talk, can't walk, certainly can't do algebra. Adding, reading, riding, riding a bike? Nobody's good at anything at first. There was a time when Einstein couldn't count to 10. And Shakespeare had to learn his ABCs just like the rest of us. Thankfully, we're born to learn. Slowly, surely, you stumble, slip, crawl, fall, and fail, and fall. Frustrating, confusing, trying, struggling, until one day, you walk, one foot in front of the other, one idea on top of the next, each wrong answer making your brain a little bit stronger. Failing is just another word for growing, and you keep going. This is learning. Knowing that you'll get it, even if you haven't gotten it yet. Because the most beautiful complex concepts in the whole universe are built on basic ideas that anyone, anywhere, can understand. Whoever you are, Wherever you are, you only have to know one thing. You can learn anything. So another exciting thing that's going on, a lot of y'all might, might know about this, but a college board, the, uh, the, the makers of the SAT, uh, they've announced a new SAT for 2016 that is more aligned with what students actually learn in school. And in part of the, as part of this, they've decided to address essentially a, an issue that's getting worse and worse over time, which is this idea of test prep, students in middle class, upper middle class, being able to have access to things that, uh, whether in perception or reality, is unleveling the playing field. And so as part of the new SAT, uh, they've reached out with us, partnering with us, so that we can create the best preparation for the new SAT for free. And what's interesting about this is it's not going to be, and you know, this is something that David Coleman, president of the, of the College Board, 
feels very strongly about, and what I and, and our team at Khan Academy feel very strongly about, this isn't, this isn't traditional test prep. This isn't, you have a week before the exam, here's some test taking strategies, et cetera, et cetera. We might, be, we might do a little bit of test familiarity, things like this. The real goal of this, and the reason why they partnered with us, is that they, they also see the whole point of the SAT is to make sure students are college ready. And on a site like Khan Academy, kids can start in fourth grade, in fifth grade, in sixth grade, in seventh grade, and through deliberate practice, unlimited practice, mastering concepts, moving at their own pace, having uh, great mentors, tutors, teachers, parents, siblings work with them, uh, uh, peers work with them to, to overcome their weaknesses, that is the best SAT prep, which is really just about measuring your ability to college, so it's really the best college prep. So this is really much more about learning the material over, um, you know, in whatever time frame that you have as opposed to some type of uh, a gamesmanship. Uh, but it's something that we're very excited about to uh, start to level the playing field a little bit more. So everything I've talked about so far is the world that most of us live in, the developing world, the developed world, the English speaking world. Uh, but a lot of y'all might be wondering, well, what about the rest of the planet? And even in the early days, uh, you know, other folks started reaching out all over the planet saying, hey, can I put the videos on a DVD? Can I take the software and put it on an offline server uh, uh, to take to a village school, et cetera, et cetera? And so we obviously said, yes, that's the whole point of Khan Academy existing, non-commercial license for free for anyone. Um, so these are all pictures of Khan Academy being used all over the planet. All of them are cool stories. Uh, probably the neatest one is the one in the top right. Uh, I used to give talks like this and say, who knows, maybe one day this will be used in Mongolia, just imagining the furthest place on the planet. A few months later, I get a, an email from Mongolia, uh, and it's the young woman in the top right, her name's Zaya, and she sent an, uh, a little YouTube link too, it was very, and I watched it, it was very similar to Charlie's video. She was explaining how she really enjoyed Khan Academy, how it was helping her in math, et cetera, et cetera. And I immediately assumed that she was middle class or upper middle class, she had access to the internet, her English was quite good. But then I read the text of the email a little bit closer, and it turned out there was a group of volunteers from uh, Silicon Valley who were going to Mongolia and setting up computer labs with broadband in orphanages. And what you see in the top right, those are the orphan girls using Khan Academy, and Zaya was one of those orphans. And that by itself was pretty mind-blowing for, for me and the team, uh, but what's been even more amazing since then is Zaya has gone on to be one of the top contributors of Khan Academy videos in the Mongolian language. Uh, so kind of a Charlie-like story where it, it, it's come back full circle. But to understand kind of where we are, what we are doing internationally, uh, we just launched, uh, well, not just, uh, uh, almost a year ago, we launched the fully Spanish Khan Academy, which obviously has a lot of implications in, in the U.S. as well, uh, where it's not just the videos, it's, this, it's the computer science environment, it's the exercises, it's the teacher dashboards, everything is available in Spanish. We've, this past year, we've also launched Brazilian, Portuguese, Turkish, French. Uh, we hope to do all of the world's major languages over the next few years. Uh, and to get a sense of what at least the videos feel like in different languages, I'll show this next montage. Me comí dos cuartos de pizza. L'hypoténuse commune, ok. Si, shi san, shi wu. Arme is hat se is block ko dhakelne ki koshish kar raha hon is direction mein. Tu jat ke taatayin min madini mi haas wa zing. Pi. آر به توان دو ضرب داره. یکی از نیکودا شبه شوک سیوم شده از فیت خوته خدمت معادل ایجاد. ایلی موزه کوله و نکوزه. این دو کانیت نگسی از کوکوبا. کوبانی. آن عالی بله آن عالی بیرونیت در. تزی مونت تزی مونت از اوت رس کویز از امپورتانتی. من زایا از مانگالیا. Why? So here's just more pictures of, uh, uh, you know, we get pictures like this on a daily basis of people all over the planet uh, using Khan Academy. And you can imagine from a walk-in closet, it's, it's fairly surreal for me. And, and now, you know, it's not just me. We have, uh, you know, a team of nearing 80 people at Khan Academy, teachers, educators, programmers, researchers. Um, we have thousands of volunteers who've helped us subtitle videos, translate videos. We've had thousands of people, uh, whether they gave $5 or, or $5,000, who've helped support the actual mission. And what I tell all of them, uh, and you know, this was a little bit delusional and I kind of kept it to myself when I started to daydream about this in 2005 and 2006, but I'm a little more open about talking now, is it, we're, we're most definitely at a special time in history, uh, you know, whatever you call it, the information revolution, and it's becoming more and more clear that it's 
it's not just, you know, it's going to help us with productivity, et cetera, et cetera. It looks like it's going to transform the human experience. And the more that we get into this revolution, this inflection point, it, it becomes clear that it's at least as big as the re Industrial Revolution. I now think it's probably going to be bigger than, than the Industrial Revolution. Probably bigger, or at least as big, maybe, than even the, the advent of the printing press. And who knows, it might even rival uh, the uh, written language or agriculture in terms of what it does to, to human civilization. And anytime you have major inflection points in history, it, it surfaces new opportunities, but it also surfaces a whole series of new problems. But then there's always a, a set of institutions that emerge to address those, those new problems, usually taking advantage of the new opportunities. And the daydream for Khan Academy, and it was a delusional daydream, and it's still somewhat delusional today, is maybe Khan Academy could be an institution or one of the institutions for this next inflection point. Something that can take this, or help take, alongside educators and parents and, and, and leaders around the world, help take this thing called education, this thing that has historically been scarce, historically been expensive, historically been the, um, the, the key determinant between the haves and have-nots, and make it a little bit more like electricity or clean drinking water and just a fundamental human right. Thank you. <laughs> so we have some time for questions. There's a microphone uh, up here. Anyone who has questions, uh, please come up uh, here to the center uh, microphone right here. I'll, I'll take them in order, and, and while uh, people, I guess we have a very shy audience. Oh, there's a couple of people walking up, I think. Otherwise, I'll make up questions. So well, the, uh, before we ask questions, I'll just, a, a, all questions, just I, I, uh, as, as short as possible, uh, just because we don't have a lot of time. I have a really quick one. Uh -huh. What is Nadia doing now? What is Nadia doing now? Very good question. I, I tell her on a regular basis there's a lot riding on her success. There's a, uh, no, it's, well, no, so she is, um, she's doing, she's a, she just graduated from college last year. She's actually an incredible writer that I have, and I have absolutely nothing to do with that at, at all. She's just a, a brilliant writer, as, as good as she is at math, and she really is excellent at math, she's even better at writing. And uh, so she went to Sarah Lawrence, which is an excellent writing program, just graduated, she, but at the same time she is, um, she's interested in becoming a doctor and actually practicing international medicine. So uh, she's now doing uh, a little bit of uh, research now, and I think she's going to go to med school in, in, in the next year or two. Yeah. Hi, Saul. From Wikipedia to YouTube to the Khan Academy, we're seeing this remarkable trajectory of the freeing of knowledge and information, the empowering of skills and passing that along. What do you predict is coming next? Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. I think, um, I, I, mean, I think even the three things that you, you named, Wikipedia, YouTube, Khan Academy, and there's many, many others, um, we're, we're only even starting to realize their utility that they play. I mean, even in YouTube, uh, you know, I've started personally using YouTube, like any question I have in the house, like how do I fix that pipe, what should I cook for dinner, uh, it, it's amazing what, what, what you can, I mean, my son, who's five, is really into origami now, and he just by himself searches on YouTube and, and, and figures out new projects to do. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know for sure what's the next thing to emerge. I can tell you what the next things to emerge from Khan Academy are going to be. Um, one, obviously we're going to continue internationalizing. Uh, we're going to continue kind of in, in, investigating kind of the, uh, the, the project-based experiential side of learning. Uh, our computer science platform is, 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 is kind of the, the furthest uh, that we've gone so far, but eventually, you know, even when we're doing the SAT prep, we're starting to explore writing and reading comprehension alongside mathematics. Um, we are doing a heavy investment in what we can do with uh, mobile and gestural devices. Obviously, if we care about international, uh, being on uh, mobile devices internationally is going to matter a lot. Um, we've actually, we're trying to really understand what can happen with an experience you know, for a long time, it sounds like a lot of y'all are on the leading edge of this. Is we've been talking about, let's use technology to free up class time to do more experiential learning. But there's a lot of constraints uh, that keep kind of more open-ended, long, deep experimentation going on. Uh, so we've actually done a, a little bit of a, a mini 30-student lab school in our offices to, to really understand uh, what we can do and then share it with other people and share best practices uh, so that we can really understand wh where the education uh, model can go. Uh, we are, 
Um, obviously, the, the, the whole SAT college board relationship is really interesting because it kind of creates a loop where uh, we can understand how effective Khan Academy actually is for students. Uh, so, and obviously we're going to increase the breadth. Uh, we have a partnership with the Aspen Institute. We actually have Supreme Court justices uh, doing videos on constitutional law. Uh, we have partnerships with some of the great museums of the world, with NASA, with the Smithsonian. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting times. The, the star map that you had, the brain map, whatever you call that, you, you said you took that off the site. I thought that that was one of the greatest features. I used to show that to kids all the time. And, and why did you decide to take that down? And would you please put it back? And... I, I love that question because I am also a fan of the knowledge map, mainly because it was one of my early inventions. Uh, but, but in all seriousness, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of value in it in that it gives students a, 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 a map and it gives them direction. I think. Uh, our, 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 our designers had a very good argument that the knowledge map became somewhat unwieldy as we went from, you know, when, when, when in 2009 we had 60 skills on the knowledge map, now we have 600 skills on the knowledge map. But I think you're spot on. You know, one of the design challenges that we're facing is how do we give that student a sense of, con or the teacher even, a sense of context and of where they are, and the knowledge map is a really fun way of doing that uh, without overwhelming them and without uh, kind of getting them lost in, in what to do next. Um, so, no, but point well taken. There's actually a little bit of a movement within Khan Academy to bring back the knowledge map. So we'll make sure I let them know about it. It sounds like a lot of folks like it. It's good to know. Hi, uh, I'm a Latin and an English teacher. Uh, Latin is kind of analogous to math. It's skill-based. English is, or sorry, it's content-based with some skills. English is more skill-based. The content is sort of up in the air. Can you talk about the mastery approach and in terms of the humanities and some of those more skill-based approaches? Yeah, no, I, you know, I think, so I think there's some aspects, and you're exactly spot on, if you're still talking about grammar, grammar is almost exactly like math, although it's probably, it probably has fewer dependencies. You know, I could teach one aspect of grammar, I could almost start with any aspect of grammar before teaching any other aspect. So it's not as dependent, but it is, it is skills-based, and you can kind of get mastery over these various skills. As you go into things like, you know, what creative writing or um, expression or communication, I think that actually gets much closer to computer science, where it is, you're using tools, you know, computer science, you're using a programming language to create something. In writing, you're creating a language to create something. Uh, but it's not easy to just say, oh, that's right or wrong. And so I can imagine some type of peer-based process where people rate each other based on rubrics. I think, you know, I always talk about the, the, the credentials of the future are not just going to be your GPA and your test scores. That's going to be a small, that's going to be a third of it. It's also going to be based on your peer-to-peer -peer kind of feedback and your portfolio. So I think in, in something like English or writing, I think your portfolio is, is probably going to be a very powerful way to document what you've done and, and also improve what, what, what you've done. So first off, I want to say that I love the idea of using a game of risk and then making those head fun bets. I think that's fantastic. No, maybe next year, because I've never done it with this many people. It would be very good. <laughs> yes. So you had said that the success of Khan Academy is 99% based on teachers who are using it. What sort of practical ways do you recommend that teachers use Khan Academy as a tool uh, to best help support the students in the class? What features are there? that can help bolster everyone? Yeah, no, excellent question. So, you know, and we don't want to force a certain way of doing it on, on anyone because, frankly, we're still learning on different ways that it's being used. And it can be used anywhere from, like, hey, here's a supplement, here's a link to a site, it might help you, all the way to what folks like Peter McIntosh and, you know, there's Summit Prep and, and, and that, that's also using Khan Academy in very forward ways. There's a school in Austin acting. And, and these are much more of the teacher saying, you know what, I'm going to uh, allow time for these students to work together and hopefully create a culture and a community where they fa to facilitate transactions and peer help. I'm going to do focus interventions, and it could be just me waiting for students to come. It might be me looking at the dashboard and, and going next to students. Um, but I think the, the hardest thing about that, because I think, you know, I, I, spoke, I meet a lot of teachers, and they, I think, philosophically agree with these ideas of mastery-based learning. But it's very, very hard when you know, the, the powers that be say, here are the 60 standards that you have to cover this year. There's 180 school days. You feel a lot of pressure to cover a standard every three days. And they know they're just covering it, that they're writing it on the board. They're, going, you know, go, they're, they're putting the information out there. Some of the students will get it. Some of them won't. And so it takes a huge leap of faith 
to say, you know what, I know these are the standards, but I also know that a lot of these students haven't mastered their, you know, if this is a ninth grade class, haven't mastered seventh, eighth grade. So it takes, it, it is a, a leap of faith to do what Peter McIntosh does. Let them work on their decimals and their fractions, even though it's a ninth grade algebra class, because then when they get to algebra, we're not going to have to fake it. There, it, it can be real algebra, they can really understand it, and that's actually going to create a foundation for them for trigonometry and calculus and whatever else. So I think the biggest thing that I would kind of put a seed in, in, in teachers' minds are it, to take that leap of faith um, and to see how you can facilitate a culture where the students' mindsets change. Uh, and I, I would actually really recommend reading a lot of the literature from Carol Dweck and uh, Angela Duckworth on, on changing students' mindset, grit, uh, growth mindset, uh, perseverance, um, and also how you can, it, it class is less about information dis dissemination and much more about interaction and, 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 and mindset coaching. Thank you so much. Yeah. So you've talked a lot about uh, tools, and of course Khan Academy is a tool and, and our collection of tools and so forth. And you've used the tools of the internet and YouTube and so on in building what you've got. What I'd like to know is when you dream, what tools do you wish you had? When I dream, what tools, um, I mean, you know, faster than light travel would be nice. <laughs> there was, um, it, you know, I, I actually think that we're at a weird stage where the technology, the tools are way ahead of the use cases. You know, even when I started using uh, YouTube, that idea of on-demand video, it was, it was already an old idea. I mean, people, even when the VCR came out, people were talking about that. So the technology was kind of predate, was, was ahead of what, what the application, even you see that today, I mean, you have people talking about, you know, Oculus Rift and virtual reality, and people are talking about all of these things. And I think the actual use cases, especially in education, are trailing it. Um, so to some degree, I, you know, I feel like there's a hundred good ideas that could be implemented with existing technology. In, in fact, with technology that existed 10 years ago, much less the stuff that, that, that exists today. Uh, but, you know, now that we have tablets, we have, um, uh, well, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a lot easier today to build things than, than I could have ever imagined even 10 years ago. Uh, what, what, what I do imagine in the future are things like, you know, I saw an amazing Oculus Rift application where you, it feels like you're in a room like this, and it's, it's to, to, to make people comfortable with public speaking. Uh, so it's very experiential, and you had all of these avatars who would like look at you and nod and pretend like they're interested, kind of like what just happened. And, but it was, it was amazing how much it felt, and it, it really made you feel confident. I mean, I practiced speeches alone in a bedroom and felt silly, but I felt like I could, I could practice it in this virtual re environment, and it really feels like the real thing. So I think there's huge applications of virtual reality. Um, I think we're only beginning to scratch the surface of what we could do with the physical environment, simulations, games, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's all the time we have for questions. One thing I will throw out, because uh, it's very exciting, we had a hackathon at Khan Academy uh, this last week where uh, the engineers and everyone gets to kind of build things that are fun. And one of the things they built, because a lot of times I get a question of what could I do um, in my school, in my classroom, in my community to kind of help this movement? Because we are not going to be able to give a free world-class education to everyone, everywhere, anyone, anywhere by ourselves. We need great educators, community leaders to help us. So the one thing that we've just launched, and it's literally like, it's an alpha version, but I would love you guys to be the, 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 the guinea pigs, is uh, an ambassador program. So it's khanacademy.org slash ambassador. And if you go there and you register, uh, you can then, it'll give you a link, and you can use that link to spread the word about Khan Academy. And then we can see who's really uh, great at kind of evangelizing what we're doing, using Khan Academy, driving a lot of learning through Khan Academy. And we hope to connect with you and kind of form a community of people who are trying to move the world in this, uh, I guess, break the Prussian model. So thank you.